I will just start out with the following. The problem that beset the French monarchy in the, in the 1770s and 1780s was that France was broke. Now, people talk about the United States being broke because we have a lot of national debt, but that's not really, that's not really the case. And, and here's the difference. If, uh, like a lot of our debt, a lo very large portion of our debt, because the dollar is basically the reserve currency for the world, is denominated in money that we can print at will. Now, you can go like off the deep end like this. That happens much less often than is sort of warned about. But imagine that, so like, we can all become insolvent. You could take all the money out of your bank account and spend it, and then you would be insolvent. But if you can, if your debts are denominated in something that you can make at will, so imagine that all the debts that you have are denominated in your own toenails, right? So you can just, you know, now, after a certain point, if you're just throwing toenails around everywhere, like the market for toenails may get inflated, but, uh, or, or bubble up or whatever. But, so for the French government, by contrast, uh, they had debts that were denominated in something which they could not produce freely, i.e. gold. Uh, they had borrowed a large amount of money to participate in the American Revolution and the Seven Years' War, both of which, well, the first one they lost, and, and the second one they, they won in the sense that the, the American revolutionaries were sort of proxies. Now, why France is a, an absolutist monarchy? So, France never goes through that moment that the English kingship does of the Magna Carta. Now, of course, the English kings ignored the Magna Carta to a greater or lesser degree. France is an absolutist monarchy run by a family that had used to be called Capet when they originally took over. When, when Louis eventually gets kind of defrocked as king, they insist on calling him Louis Capet, which really annoys him because he had never been called that his entire life. He'd always just been called King Louis um, or Dauphin before he was king. But uh, so in, in England, there's a sort of moment where the great barons of the realm go to the king, kind of hold him at sword point and say, sign this thing like constraining your power. But this never happens to the French kings. And so uh, there's a moment uh, at which Louis XIV, Louis XVI's grandfather, is supposed to have said, that, now this may be apocryphal, but even if it is, it's too good a story not to tell, and it really illustrates something. Uh, someone asked him about some, some thing about the state, and he's supposed to have said, le tasse moi, like, I am the state. Like there's no, you know, so I can do whatever I want, right? Because I, there is no state that exists independent of me. So Louis uh, was very used to this idea of royal prerogative. Here's the, here's the thing about France being broke. One reason was that they had, uh, so they had spent a fantastic amount of money losing the Seven Years' War and then winning the, the, the War of Independence or helping the American colonists to do so. Why did they do that? So France is an absolutist monarchy. Why are they backing a bunch of people who are running around saying, you know, eventually, at the, in the beginning of the, of, the, of the U.S. War of Independence, and I will just say, by the way, that uh, this, for those of you who go to the lecture series that I persistently give at, at the main branch of the library, this year it's going to be uh, American Revolution, uh, and I'm going to start next week on, I believe, the 21st of March doing Origins of the American Revolution. But one of the things you notice is that the American Revolution goes through this sort of pr process from uh, we want to be governed better by the king to let's not have a king uh, as a sort of later step. But uh, the, you know, the question you want to ask is why is it that, uh, that the French monarchy is interested in backing this group of people who are not very down with monarchist principles by, the seven, by 1779, 17, 1780, etc. And the reason is because they figure what's bad for England has got to be good for them, which, which is not like, which is not wrong sort of prima facie, except that they had to borrow so much money, they had to spend so much money. Now, another thing that, that is going on here is that the French taxation system is extremely regressive. If you are a noble, or if you are in the clergy, you pay no taxes at all. So now if you're a noble, you're not allowed to do anything in terms of like commerce, because that's viewed as kind of low, as the sort of thing that, that doesn't. There's two kinds of nobles, by the way. There's what's called the noblesse de paix, or the nobles of the sword. They're the more ancient families who sort of got where they are by being sort of military leaders. 
and what's called the noblesse de robe, or the nobles of the robe, who are uh, more administrative nobles. But in both cases, you're not allowed to engage in commerce. So if you're noblesse de robe, you're getting paid by the state. You do not pay any taxes. If you're noblesse de pay, you're getting paid usually because you own land and you basically uh, shave a percentage of either uh, payment in kind or payment in money from the people working your land. But you do not pay any taxes. So the only people paying taxes are the people sort of what you might call further down the income distribution. Uh, and they pay a lot of taxes. Uh, the capitation and the vintiam. Uh, the vintiam was a kind of occasional tax that occasionally the king would, when he needed money, would declare. Uh, the capitation was a sort of uh, more like a poll tax in the sense of like local taxation. The tile was one that everybody who was not a noble or a clergyman paid. Um, it was done kind of slightly differently in the north. It was called the tile personnel, and it was done sort of by household. Uh, in the, uh, the tile réel in the south in Languedoc, Provence, Guyenne, Dauphiné, it was done more, uh, it was done on, a, uh, on the basis of your land rather than on the basis of your person. Uh, and then there was what's called the gabel. The gabel is a salt tax. Uh, and the gabel is really interesting in the sense that it varied from place to place and it could be very high. You were sort of, c buying salt was compulsory, not only because you need salt to, you know, our bodies need it, but also because uh, they wanted to raise money, so you had to buy a certain amount statutorily. And the, the gabel could vary quite dramatically from place to place, so that uh, there was a very uh, intense business of uh, salt smuggling from places where the gabel was low to places where the gabel was high. Now also, uh, the uh, tax collection was privatized, very heavily privatized. There were what we call famille générale. And what they would be, what they would, would happen is you would buy this office. So you would pay the government for this office. And then the deal was the government would say, okay, this is your area and this is how much money that you're expected to come up with. And how you come up with it is really your business. Uh, you can't get it from nobles and you can't get it from the church or the abbeys or whatever. But everyone else is fair game. And if you happen to end up with some more over the top, well, within certain limits, you know, that's okay. As long as you come up with X amount of money, that's fine. But that's not really a very good way to run a railroad, you know what I'm saying? Because really what it means is that uh, the, the people, and, and taxation extended to everybody. It was, it was really quite ruinous. But even at that, that amount of money that they were taking in was not enough to uh, fill the coffers, which were constantly, war is just fabulously expensive. I mean, it is today, and back then it was, it was absolutely no different. And this is why eventually you get Wars like the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century, or the Wars of the Revolution, the French Revolutionary Wars slightly later on, or Sherman's March to the Sea, where the army, you know, the, those of you who've been in and around the military will have heard the, the, the old adage about an army marches on its stomach. Well, so if you're going to get supplies, one way you can do it is by buying them. Another way you can do it is just by taking whatever is around. And this is what Sherman did. This is why Sherman has a very black name down below the Mason-Dixon line because Sherman just marched into the South and took everything that the army needed and burned the rest, mostly. Um, and this is, why, uh, this is why the Thirty Years' War was so ruinous because you had these, those of you who may have read the, the, the children's book Stone Soup, like when soldiers, soldiers show up in town, the townspeople really don't like this because what's, what do soldiers want to do? Number one, they're armed, and number two, they're hungry. And, um, and, and that's not a good, that's not a good combination for the local, the local population. So France at this point, the population is roughly 26 million people, which doesn't seem like that much, but is a lot in the era sort of prior to uh, industrial farming. The clergy uh, compose about 130,000, it'll come back here in a minute, uh, or 0.5% or, uh, of the population. A large proportion of them are uh, parish priests. And there's an interesting, this will come up sort of later, there's an interesting kind of class division that goes on. So when the, when, the, when the sort of representatives of the country are kind of called together, a lot of the bishops and the abbots are like, yeah, you know, the system is great right now. And the parish priest is like, well, 
for you, like I'm eating turnips here and you know, having to do like occasional labor to keep myself from starving. Then there's once again the nobility, about 390,000 people or about 1.5% of the population. And once again, there's an enormous range of who they are. There are some who uh, are fabulously wealthy. And I mean, if you've ever seen um, uh, Dangerous Liaisons, it's a, it's a great sort of illustration of exactly what it was like if you were that uh, gigantically wealthy. By the way, and this is for whatever it's worth, you know, if you ever see um, the Mel Brooks movie, History of the World, part one, sort of last segments of the French Revolution, they have someone carrying, going around carrying a bucket for people to relieve themselves in, and that's probably not all that far from the case. Uh, because, you know, somebody once said that, there's a, there's a story, once again, probably apocryphal, but who knows, of, of Benjamin Franklin leading a French princess around f Philadelphia, and they pass an abattoir, and he's kind of sort of covering his nose, and she doesn't, and he says, well, didn't you notice the horrible stench here? Like, well, it does, doesn't really smell that much worse than Versailles. Um, <laughs> Uh, although people bathe more often than is commonly, bathing was a kind of upper class thing, so like, so there's, there's this, and then there's the, the monarchy, and then there are what are called the parlement, the parliaments. Now the parliaments are not like par like the English parliament, what they are is law courts, and they're uh, composed of uh, relatively wealthy groups of judges and lawyers, uh, and what they're there for, I mean, partly they're there as a sort of like, like the circuit courts in the United States, but partly what they're there for is, when uh, the king promulgates a law, it has to be taken to the parliaments for each of the 15 regions. They have to sort of certify it and promulgate it. And they can say no, right? Now, if they do, then the king can issue what's called a lit de justice, where he can say, okay, you've had your say, now promulgate the law. So the king, once again, is, 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 his power is technically absolute, although, as we'll discover in a minute here, not quite so much. There have been some sort of interesting cultural developments going on in France around this time, particularly uh, what we have sort of come to call the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment has a lot of phases. It's centered in France. It involves a very small number of people. Like if you read uh, Peter Gay's excellent uh, two-volume History of the Enlightenment, what you discover is they all knew each other. Um, so there's a very, there's a story which I will digress and tell about, uh, so Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a notoriously strange guy. He had a kind of skin disease. He was wearing a cassock all the time. And he was very odd. He was always sort of like, um, sort of like discovering that people had some beef against him and sort of like, you know, or creating these conflicts with people and kind of throwing himself on their, you know, prostrating himself before them, sort of apologizing or whatever. Anyway, so Rousseau went to Scotland and ended up meeting up with David Hume, and they were having dinner, and, and he had a letter from, I forget which one of the other philosophers, but they all, they all sort of knew each other. It was kind of letter, letter writing society. And, and Rousseau, this is according to one of the biographies, as the, in the course of the dinner, it sort of decides that, that Hume has like disapproves of him somehow. So they get to the end of dinner and, and Rousseau like runs around to Hume and sort of like starts apologizing profusely. Hume is this very like stolid kind of doer Scotsman who is just very confused by all of this. And he writes a letter to, and I forget who the sort of letter of introduction was from, but he, the, the substance of which is like, who is this guy? Like what? You know, what is up with him? But the, the, so the, the Enlightenment, the philosophes were basically a group of people who uh, were very interested in the power of reason as a way of organizing society. And, and Rousseau, you know, writes the social contract. Uh, basically, you know, he starts out with these very powerful lines. Man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. And why is that? And his sort of, his answer is that society is really terrible for us and if we could just sort of get back to whatever was beforehand, we would be better off. But one of the things that we don't need is kings, right? Uh, and, and Rousseau uh, ends up getting sort of chased around because uh, telling people that kings are a terrible idea is something that kings themselves rather disapprove of. Uh, there are small groups of Protestants. Protestantism is essentially illegal, especially after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. The Catholic Church is extremely powerful in France. Uh, and there's a constant sort of like push and pull going on because what the French king wants, number one, is the power to appoint bishops, the power to appoint church officials. The Pope says, no, I'm like the Lord, I'm the sort of king of the spiritual world, so I get to say, but why does the king want this? Because he wants money. The, practically everything that Louis does 
is because he wants money. And, and not just because he's avaricious, although, I mean, he's no more or less avaricious, I think, than the average person, but because he's kind of hurting for cash all the time. Uh, and then there's, I'll just say briefly about, there's a faction of Catholicism called Jansenism. Jansenists uh, were sort of like very austere brand of, of Catholicism that was viewed as kind of slightly heretical. But they were very much more, they sort of verged on kind of a predestinarian type belief. But the vast majority of, of, of France is very pronouncedly Catholic, especially in the rural areas. What's interesting is that there's a very strong degree of what's called anti-clericalism. Now, anti-clericalism is not being anti-Christian. Anti-clericalism is being kind of suspicious of, the, of the, the foibles of the church, let's say. Or I mean, here's a good example. Um, Machiavelli, like anti-clericalism is very powerful in Italy, ironically enough, because it's the sort of where, it's where the center of Catholicism is. Machiavelli wrote this play at one point, and, and in, in the play, a husband and wife are talking, and the, the wife is talking about some mendicant friar who's gotten one of the local girls pregnant. And what a surprise this is, and the husband says, what really would have been a surprise is if he hadn't done that. Uh, so there was a kind of jaundiced view of the, of the, of the clergy even while people were very, very pronouncedly Catholic at this point. Louis was not a bad guy. Uh, Louis gets a bad rap, and so does Marie Antoinette. And, and let me just sort of say, uh, Louis was not a terrible person. I've been reading Peter Ackroyd's excellent histories of the, of the English monarchy, and let me just tell you, there are a lot worse people who've been king of things than, than, than Louis. Uh, Louis was a little dense, um, but he wasn't really a bad person. He liked to hunt. And he liked being king. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> right. I would like being king too until they put me in the tumbrel and take me to the place to look, chop my head off. Um, but yeah, he really, you know, what he wanted was a lot of nice hunting expeditions and to have some nice wine. His, his wife, Marie Antoinette, was the sister of the Holy Roman Emperor. And uh, she was Austrian. She didn't really want to come to France all that much. She, it's famously attributed to her that in the course of some sort of famine type period, of which there were none by this point, like there, were, there was a bad harvest in 1774 and another bad harvest in 1788, which made things kind of bad for people, but it wasn't like people starving in the streets as there had been you know, at other times. But she's notorious for having, people attribute to her this line about let them eat, let them eat cake, which is let them eat brioche, which is a kind of nicer bread than the black bread that, that most of the, the lords ate. She didn't say this. It's, uh, Rousseau freelanced this in about 1765 and attributed it to some unnamed princess. It's possible that Marie Therese, the wife of uh, Louis XIV, said something like this. But even at that, you have to sort of understand what's... Uh, Marie Antoinette was a kind of child of her time. You know, she was raised in a very rarefied environment. I mean, she's very, she's like the one-tenth of the one-tenth of a one percent. And people, she gets kind of a bad rap. She, when they built Versailles, she had built this like peasant village so that her and her friends could sort of dress up like peasant women and pretend to do work. And, and that went over kind of badly <laughs> among people who knew it. But she was a very a strong patron of charities. And she really uh, did feel for the common people to the extent that she really knew what was going on with them. And it was, it was very easy not to know that, especially if you were, you know, at the top of an absolutist monarchy. So, you know, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to necessarily defend absolutist monarchy, but uh, I, I feel kind of bad for, for Louis and Marie Antoinette because they, they've been really vilified by history uh, and they really were not as people in that position go, they weren't that bad. I mean, really, there were some English kings, especially in the 13th and 14th century, whose entire goal in life was just, you know, squeezing them till the pips squeak. Uh, and they, Louis was, Louis was really not that bad. But so eventually they realized they're broke. This is a kind of, this is a cartoon from the time, and this is like the third estate. Uh, this is the, the noble, or the church, you can see the crucifix there, and then the noble sitting on them, and it's basically like, the, the, the nobles toting around, the, or the, the third estate toting around the other estates of the realm. They hire this guy, Jacques Necker, who's a, a, a Swiss banker. 
And they say to Necker, okay, so we want you to do a sort of statement of accounts. So if you want to know what's up with the US government's finances, it all is public. It's very hard to read through. You have to be an accountant to really understand a lot of it. And there's some parts of the budget that are, there's some parts like the defense budget which are not public. But by and large, the finances of the country are public. And they have to be partly because uh, a lot of what the US government does, the way, it's, the way it funds itself is through bond sales. So people who are, the people who are buying bonds have to know what the, what the position of the government is financially. But it was secret back then. And, and the king was under absolutely no obligation to make it public whatsoever. But they hire this guy, Necker. Uh, and Necker sort of starts going through. And Necker comes up with this report, the Comte de Rendu, in which he says that the expenditures uh, of the state, the income of the state, outpaces the expenditures by 10 million livres a year. Um, this was a fantasy. It was just not true. And, um, uh, uh, but what it did do when he released this document was allow the French government to go to a bunch of bankers and say, look, we have, you know, we're, we're doing okay. Like, we got income that, that, that surpasses the, our debts. Why don't you lend us 53 million livres so we can do some other things? Now, bankers write, um, there's, they're in a sort of interesting position vis-a-vis -vis governments at this point, like, because they really have no power to compel in the way that bankers do now. Like, Bankers now, I mean, this is more sort of threatened than actually happens, but will cause your bonds to, to go down the toilet if you, if you don't do right. But back then, you know, say I'm the king and you're my banker or you're a banker from somewhere else and you make me a loan, I might repay it to you or I might not. And if I don't, the consequence for you can be pretty catastrophic. The consequence for me is that I might not be able to get the next loan. But there's not much that you can do to make me pay. What the banker wants to do is have some evidence that, I mean, once again, if you're a banker, you don't want to lend to somebody who doesn't have like a legitimate, basically when you're lending money, what you're doing is buying an income stream, right? So the repayment is going to be this, this stream of, of revenue that you're buying. And if there is no stream of revenue that you're buying, then lending money to that person is basically just shooting it down a rat hole which bankers are disinclined to do, unless someone is going to bail them out. Right, so when the Russian financial collapse happened in the late 90s, like, the bankers, New York bankers were like, like, on one line had the Russian government talking about loaning the money, and on the other hand, on the other line had the IMF talking about how big the bailout was going to be. Um, but that's back in those days, there was no bailout. There was just the, 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 the ship of state becomes insolvent, the ship of state sinks. So Necker is eventually um, uh, dismissed, and they bring in uh, Lemeny de Brienne. Lemeny de Brienne, Necker, part of his problem was that he couldn't be uh, an actual minister because he was foreign. And later on, he gets brought back, and he sort of says, well, I'll do this if you make me minister. And then they say, no, you can't, and he leaves again. They bring in Lemeny de Brienne, who's sort of the queen's guy. And Brienne says, I think very sensibly, we really need to increase our tax revenue. So the king... Uh, tries to sort of issue a series of taxes. But it turns out that here is one of the places where statutorily the king cannot just behave as he wants to. Uh, and he said, the, the, the parliament say, no, you can't do this. They're, the only way you can raise taxes uh, on anybody but the people who are already paying them, let's be clear, is to call what's called the Estates General. The Estates General, so the, the country is, 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 is broken up into what are, what are called estates. Um, and the estates, there's three estates. There's the first estate, which is the clergy, the second estate, which is the nobility, and the third estate, which is everybody else. And these aren't really classes, because as we were saying before, they were, they were rich and poor in all three estates. The, the parliament say, well, no, we're not going to do this. There's a sort of interesting moment in, in 1788 where Louis tries to do this. He, he sort of schedules a meeting, and then he says, well, I'm going to go hunting. And then he and his, all of his sort of aristocratic friends show up in their hunting gear at the, at the meeting. And he's trying to get the taxes sort of instituted again. And they're having this debate about it. And uh, his brother, the Duke of Orléans, who was called Philippe Galité, he had some very sort of like oddly bougie, uh, Bolshevik kind of tendencies. 
in the, in the process of this says, well, sire, what you're proposing here is illegal. And, and this is, this, you know, the thing about the, thing about the le tassemois is like maybe apocryphal. But this, we do know that Henry, that Louis said, uh, it is legal because I wish it. Eventually this breaks down. He calls what's sort of like a, a, an assembly of notables. That is to say, they, they try and get some of the sort of bigger the people in the realm together. But the, the result is the same. There needs to be what's called an estates general. The estates general has not been called since 1615. And it's not entirely clear how it's supposed to work. Although there are some things that are clear, which is, number one, everyone gets a sort of roughly equal amount of people, and you vote by estate. So the third estate gets one vote, the second estate gets one vote, the first estate gets one vote. Well, if you're in the third estate, you can immediately see a problem with this, right? Because the first and second estates have a kind of commonality of interest that they don't have with you, except in some sort of abstract uh, and, in practice, non-existent sense. In, in late 1788, Louis announces that there's going to be an estates general. And a number of things happen. One of the things that happens is uh, a fellow by, name, by the name of Emmanuel Joseph Saez, who's an, he's an abbot, uh, he didn't really want to go into the church. He was sort of like his family kind of like, his family said, well, you know, you're a little sickly, you can't go into the army, do this instead. This was a common way to, to get into this line of work. Uh, writes an essay called What is the Third Estate, which has come down to us as a very famous piece of political writing uh, and really should have acted as a warning to people who are arguing about this. Famously, he says at the beginning, what is the third estate? Everything. Two. What has it been hitherto in the political order? Nothing. Rien. What does it desire to be? To become something. And then he goes through talking about what is important about the third estate. The third estate is the, reason, the only reason that anything happens in this country. We could do without the other two estates. You know, he calls them dead weight. Uh, we don't need a bunch of, of aristocrats. We don't need a bunch of rich clerics. They don't produce anything. They don't make anything. They don't do anything that the state needs done. Uh, the third estate embraces all that, which, all that which belongs to the nation, and all that which is not the third estate cannot be regarded as being of the nation. In this era, there's a very pronounced pamphlet culture going on, and people, the, the literacy never rose about above 40 or 45% in this time. But even if you couldn't read, you know, these pamphlets would get circulated and people would sort of read them in the bars out loud. And if you were in one of these sort of upper levels of society, this is the kind of thing that should really alarm you. Not only because of the sentiment that's being expressed here, right, but because of who's expressing it. This guy is not, you know, like a cobbler from Tours or whatever. He's like, he's, he's a pretty well-connected guy in the first estate. And he's saying, he's raising some real questions that if you think hard about them, why do you need those first two estates? And a lot of people started thinking very, very pronouncedly about this. But he also says in the course of this, the estate should vote by head. So it's sort of discussed previously that they're going to double the third estate. This, is, this sort of is conceded. So um, they hold these uh, elections in, in the spring of 1789. And election is, is open to anybody who, any male, any male, let's just be clear. Uh, later on, the rights of women get discussed. There's a very prominent text. Uh, there are a number of very prominent feminists feminist, especially Olympe de Gouges, who was so prominent a feminist that eventually they executed her. The revolutionaries did. I mean, this is, it's not like the king was like, oh, this feminism is terrible. It was like the revolutionaries later on, it was just like, this lady is really a pain. Let's just move her down the road. Any man who pays taxes can vote. I mean, number one, this is a pretty incredible thing, right? Because you've been in a, like, we all take voting for granted. We take so much for granted that half of the eligible voters in the country don't bother to do it. But here, this is a quite remarkable thing. All of a sudden, you're getting asked your opinion about things, which is like a fairly novel experience for you if you're a French, like, average person. There's no, there's really, the, like, there's a kind of a middle class which is very tiny, but it's mostly, like, people way up here and a large mass of people uh, living sort of just above the level of, of, of subsistence. So they have these, they have this election. They also collect what are called the cahiers de doléances, which are these lists 
of grievances. And each, the, 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 each estate in each area composes them. And they're mostly pretty, they, they survived, and they, they, there's, a, there's some really interesting studies of them, because they're a sort of way that you can kind of get insight into, I mean, this is a sort of worm's eye view of what was up with people. Because by and large, you know, it's hard for our eyes to see the way certain kinds of people live back in those days, because they didn't write. I mean, it wasn't, or the kinds of, certain kinds of people did write. If you were a noble, you were certainly literate, probably. Uh, if you were a cleric, you were almost certainly literate. Some of the parish priests probably weren't, but, um, but, uh, but if you're like a cobbler or a fishmonger or whatever, chances are you're either illiterate or there's no point in your like writing down your experiences because who cares, right? Who would you be? It's, this is like, this is prior to the sort of culture we have today where everybody's supposed to care about how everybody lives. Like, like Facebook would not have made uh, any sense to them because who cares? If you, you know, uh, who cares what you did? Like anybody who cared knew already because they, they were living in your household. Um, so we have these, these interesting uh, lists of what people were interested in. And once again, you can kind of see divisions within the estates, but you can also see people kind of saying, it's not like people were getting out and saying like, God, oh, the king is terrible off with his head. By and large, what they were saying was, please king, make things better for us. What, you know, there's this sort of idea, if the king only knew how awful things were, the king is probably a good guy. In any way, God means him to be king. I mean, this is, like the, this is, this is uh, very much an era of the divine right of kings. And, and so if somebody is king, it's because God means him to be. I mean, in a slightly earlier period, people also thought, there's no point in treating disease, because if you get sick, God means that to happen for you, to happen to you. Um, and the world is sort of all one, right? So it, there, there's some people are meant to be on the top. And the, when you read in the cahier, the, the idea is not like, let's break everyone all down to one level. The, the idea is, let's make the system as it exists work in a way that, that does justice to everybody. They had these elections. You get 303 delegates from the first estate. Uh, Two thirds of them are parish priests. And this will have interesting consequences. The second estate, 282 delegates, mostly from the upper nobility. So it's the upper nobility that's electing the other upper nobility, by and large. And then the third estate, I included this line from Henry VI, part two, where the, the sort of rebel Jack Cade says, uh, first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. My, my apologies to any of you in here who ha might happen to be lawyers. Um, but when they hold the elections for the third estate, it turns out that about 50% of the people that they send up there are lawyers or local officials. And this makes a certain kind of sense, right? Because if you're a lawyer, you're used to speaking in public. You're used to formulating arguments. You're used to convincing people. Uh, so it's not surprising that a very large proportion of the people who get sent up there are barristers. The interesting, interesting thing is that when in 1792 and 1793, which we'll, we'll get to in a, my subsequent lecture, uh, you get to like some very radical things happening, it's a lot of the same people, right? People get sent up to Paris, and then, you know, so all these guys, Brousseau and Robespierre, they're all lawyers. It's not like the radical, like, hoi polloi who are running around, although they're doing that too, in a slightly different way, but the people in the assemblies, by and large, are are sort of mid-level kind of professional people. So this is a, a, a contemporary painting of the meeting of the, of the Estates General. And you can see Louis is up here, with this kind of goofy round face. And here are the, here's the first estate. You can tell they're all dressed in black and the guys wearing this sort of like skull cap. And then there's the second estate there. And the third estate is back out of frame somewhere. And the, you know, they got there and they said, this is going to be just like it was in 1614. You know, we're all, we're going to vote by order. And, you know, basically we're just here to like resolve the tax question and then everything will be fine. And the people in the third estate were like, no, we're not going to do it that way. Uh, what we think is uh, that we should all vote by head. We should all, everybody, one man, one vote. Because that's the, you know, if we're, going to, if we're going to be approving things, we're going to be changing the laws, like that's the way it should happen. The king gets very alarmed by this. Because he, you know, it was bad enough to have to sort of subject his decisions to these considerations. But now, 
he's got a bunch of people who really, really considers pretty down market, who want to now say like, and because, right, there's like 500 in some of the third estate, so it's going to take, they're going to have a big say, and this is an alarming thing uh, for everybody. What turns out to happen is that uh, they start, uh, the third estate starts peeling off delegates from the other two estates, and especially the parish priests. So the parish priests are mostly living a pretty hand-to-mouth existence. Uh, they don't get you know, they're not living in the, in the nice bishoprics, they're not living in the nice rich abbeys. They're out there with these small benefices, or maybe two, uh, and chances are, and they can't, they have no other sort of way of like raising money, so basically they, uh, they start saying, yeah, this, is, this seems like a pretty good idea. Well, this causes uh, Louis to sort of have some real second thoughts, and he keeps trying to impress upon delegates we're, we're going to do this the old school way, right? It was good enough for 1650 and it's good enough for now. I mean, this is like, part of what's going on here is a sort of uh, change in the way that time is viewed, right? I mean, once again, so I was talking earlier about how at a certain later point they just declare it the year zero and they rename all the months. Um, up until this point, people really thought of time as kind of, that things were the way they were. I mean, some, this is a fairly considerable body of thought that things were deteriorating. but. By and large, people thought, well, things are as they've always been and are going to continue to be this way into the future. And now you have these Enlightenment people saying, well, no, things are progressing. Human beings can make themselves better. And that, you know, that's kind of inbuilt into our way of thinking, interestingly enough. I mean, even if you're a conservative, even if, you know, you think of yourself as a conservative, like, and by the way, conservatism as a, as a concept, as a, as a French revolutionary, as a post-revolutionary thing, it comes around in the sort of like monarchist thinkers in the early 19th century after the, after the, the kind of end of the revolution. Um, but even if you're a conservative, you still have to concede the idea, we're not going back to having a monarchy, right? And none of us, I, let me be clear, most of us probably don't want that. But, uh, we have an idea of progress, right? You know, like, where science will make things better. Like, we'll figure out how to cure diseases so that people don't die of the pleurisy or, you know, whatever. Um, but for, for these people, for a large body in French society, the idea of progress is uh, literally revolutionary and, and not in a good way, right? You know, so we have, we've gotten sort of, because of the way the American Revolution happened, we sort of, we tend to think of, of things that are revolutionary. I mean, revolutionary means kind of good to us in a, in a, in a certain sense, right? You know, people talk about the American Revolution. I mean, and we have a pretty positive feeling about the American Revolution. No, I do. Like, I mean, I like the, the British just fine, but I don't want to live in a monarchy. Um, but for these people, the idea of revolution is a very dangerous sort of and, and novel way of thinking about things. So the Henry sort of says, or Louis, I've been listening to things about English kings, half of whom are named Henry and the other half are named Edward, but on the 5th of May, the sort of, that's, that's, that's sort of like image of the people meeting. And then on the 6th of May, it's sort of communicated to the third estate, well, the, the voting by orders thing is still going to happen. And, and there's this process between early May and early June of the leadership of the third estate trying to peel off members of the other estates to kind of get on board with the voting by head. And on the 13th of June, the representatives of the third estate call publicly for this to happen. I mean, so it's one thing to be sort of like, hey, you know, maybe. It's another thing to get out in a public session and say, we call upon the members of the other estates to vote with us. Now, a lot of the members of those other states are like not, not down for this. But a a fair number of them are. There's also a certain number, by the way, of aristocrats, of people in the kind of lower squirearchy, who are representatives of the third estate, too, by the way. And this is a kind of interesting element of its composition. So Louis says, well, everybody go, you know, let's, let's think about this for a while. They come back. This is, once again, the meeting of the estates. But on the 20th of June, they come to the place where they're supposed to be meeting, and it's locked. And all of a sudden, the people in the third estate are like, well, what's going on here? Is this going to be like, you know, are we all going to be shot or whatever? Or, you know, is this, is this, is the king going to try and enforce his will? So they retire to a nearby tennis court 
uh, indoor tennis court, which is the kind of thing that you would find in the nicer sections of town. This is in Versailles. The, for any of you who haven't been to the to region of Paris, Versailles is about 12 miles sort of southwest of, of, of the center of Paris, or was in those days. Now it's in suburban Paris, basically. But. So they retired to this tennis court. They've declared on the 17th of June that they're a national assembly. So they say, like, no, we're not, it's not going to be the Estates General anymore. We're going to have a national assembly, and we're going to reconfigure the state. Now, at this point, the idea is still, like, it's going to be a monarchy. They're, they're not getting out here and being like, let's get rid of the king. What they want is, and, and you see this when you look at the sort of history of, of European monarchy, you see sort of repeated iterations of this. What they want is to organize the state in such a way that it, it operates systematically and makes sense. I mean, people complain about the bureaucracy, right? But the fact of the matter is, the only way you operate a mass society is with bureaucracy. Now, bureaucracy can work better or worse. Bureaucrats can develop, you know, motivations which are not, strictly speaking, to do the, you know, the strict definition of their job. But uh, what, they, what the people want, what the third estate wants is, uh, number one, for the burden of taxation to be spread out in a more equitable way, but also for uh, the king to be, have, have like limited powers and for there to be a sort of uh, document stating what the rules are. So what the absolutist king wants and what the, the kings of most European states have wanted since time immemorial is for whatever I want right now to be the rules. And if I want something different tomorrow, then that'll be the rule at that point. Um, now, if you're, you know, there are a lot of problems with this, and you can think about this if you run a business, right? You don't like that idea. If you run a business, you want the rules today to be the rules tomorrow, the rules the next day, because you've got to be making plans for how you're going to run your business and how things are going to be in a month or two months or six months or a year or whatever. So what you don't want is for the king to be able to come down six months from now after you've made your sort of careful plans about how you're going to organize yourself and say, well, no, uh, now you need to give me this like X amount of money, or now the rules about how your business is going to operate is going to be different, um, especially if you're in the export business. What, the, what the, the third estate wants is for the king to be limited statutorily. They don't want to get rid of him. They just want to have a set body of rules that he has to obey. And so they retire to this tennis court. There's a very famous image of it. So this is the tennis court oath. You can kind of see the kind of stalls around the side where people would watch. But basically what they say is, we're going to constitute ourselves, and we swear that we're not going to, we're not going to like break apart until we have, we're not going to go back to our, our homes until we've created a government for France that's going to be consistent and, and sort of law-based. While this is going on, there's been a lot of unrest at the kind of lower end of the spectrum, uh, especially around France. The harvest is bad in 1788. People are very, very worried and upset about things. There's a, a widespread feeling of discontent about the way things had been going, and one sort of symbol of that was the, the prison in the eastern part of Paris called the Bastille. The Bastille notoriously was the place that political prisoners would get sent. So if the king didn't like you, he could order what was called, he could issue what was called a letter to cachet and just have you arrested and just stuck there for however long. He was under no obligation to give you a trial necessarily. So you could just be, this could be sort of permanent detention. And there was a feeling uh, among people in the sort of, especially in the kind of middling lower orders, that, that this was grossly unfair. So uh, in the course of, so one thing also that's, that's worth knowing about the Bastille is, so this is the, this is the front of the Bastille, and it faces off toward the Faubourg Saint-Antoine. Faubourg is, a, is, is, is the neighborhood or se sort of section of the town. And the Faubourg Saint-Antoine is this very large neighborhood in the eastern part of Paris, that's basically one of the big, probably the biggest working class area. And the Bastille, sort of like facing onto the Faubourg Saint Antoine, is a kind of statement to the people there of French, of royal power. This idea sort of gets going that there's going to be a, that the, that the king is going to sort of uh, assert dictatorial power. And a mob gets going uh, and decides that they're going to liberate the Bastille.
So they attack the Bastille. The only people there, as it turns out, once they, once they, once they storm the Bastille, there's only about seven people there, and they're all pretty common criminals. They're not like, you know. Um, but they free them. And the, the people defending it are Swiss guards led by a governor named Delaunay. Um, the Swiss guards eventually surrender, and uh, a lot of them are killed. Delaunay is, the plan I think is originally to take him to the city hall and have some sort of trial, but he just gets killed in the street. His head gets put on a pike and sort of paraded around. And this, I mean, this happens on the 14th of July. And this is a sort of key moment in this, in this sort of situation in the sense that, uh, I mean, now Bastille Day is the big, it's like our 4th of July. But, it, I mean, it's kind of an ironic thing because really, once again, there was like the Bastille was pretty much empty at that point. It was more sort of symbolic. And the point was, we, the kind of lower orders, are going to assert our political power. Now, this becomes a lot more important once the things spiral a little bit out of control in 1792 and 1793. What ends up happening, just to sort of give you a preview, not that we're going to go there now, is so political power in France is really very concentrated in Paris. I mean, there are things going on in the... Paris is as big as the next nine largest French cities all put together. It's this very... There's a kind of spatial dimension of the revolution, and it's because the, the power is sort of concentrated in Paris. And if you see... Let me see if I've successfully put this map in here. So this is... It's a little hard for you to see, but Paris is really uh, basically five miles here. And so there's the, the Louvre right there. There's the Bastille. Uh, there's the Faubourg Saint Antoine. Uh, there's the Hotel de Ville. So there are these sort of like local assemblies. And at a certain point, like the city government starts thinking, well, things are kind of getting a little radical in those assemblies. So we're going to split them up into what are called sections. So each neighborhood is going to have a sort of governing body called a section. And everybody in the neighborhood gets to be a member. This is later on after the, after the execution of the king. What happens is the Paris sections become a kind of political force unto themselves. And part of the problem is, I mean, you have what are called enragés, like people mostly kind of drunk, standing on street corners, just haranguing crowds. But you also have in the sections people showing up to these meetings. Eventually the meetings become continuous, right? And who's showing up to them? People who are unemployed. And they just sort of sit around drinking wine and making rules for what's going to, or sort of like getting, you know, getting more and more worked up. But this is at a sort of, this is, this is part of things really spiraling out of control, which we'll get to with the sort of the other end of this process. So in 1789, there's a kind of a long, hot summer. And the, the, the third estate keeps sort of like pushing on this idea that they all have to vote together. And finally, a number of the aristocrats start saying, thinking that this is kind of the way the wind is blowing. And they end up with this long meeting on the night of the 4th and 5th of August where the aristocrats, a lot of them, get up and say, okay, we're going to get rid of aristocratic privilege. We're going to get rid of the privilege of extracting taxation from peasants. We're going to get rid of a lot of the sort of uh, uh, leaders of the, of the uh, richer clergy, you know, get up and say the same thing. And this is this sort of moment where you know, it's another one of these sort of like all-night meetings. Uh, so much of the French Revolution happens kind of at night. And in what gets called now the Legislative Assembly, they have this sort of continuing meeting going on where you have people sitting on these benches. There's a sort of like rostrum in the middle. And then you have uh, on one side the sort of more radical people, and in the center kind of more moderate people, and on the right the more sort of monarchist people. And then in the seats sort of up at the top, you have what are called the Montagnards, who are like the very most radical. And you have galleries around the side where all sorts of people can come in and offer sort of like commentary in real time on what's going on. And this is a very alarming thing. I mean, think about if you're, you know, you know think about what the US Congress would be like if they were constantly surrounded by angry, probably slightly drunk people most of the time. And, and being hectored constantly. I mean, you think it works badly now, that, that's a real recipe for, but also, by the way, this is where sort of when you hear people talk about left and right politically, th this is exactly where it comes from, the, the French Legislative Assembly, so that on the left are the sort of more radical people, on the right are the technically more conservative, although radical can also mean conservative, but that's 
another story. On the 26th of August, a document is issued that's put together by Saez and by uh, Lafayette. Lafayette is a really interesting character. He's fought, as, as we all know, in the, in the American Revolution. Uh, he's a, he's a, a fairly well-to-do aristocrat, but he's also a monarchist. And poor old Louis got some very bad advice for a lot of time. And Lafayette tries to sort of tell him, like, this is how we can get through this. You know, you're going to have to concede some of your power, right? But uh, Lafayette is also a person who's been very influenced by the ideas of the American Revolution. And once again, the American Revolution is not about, let's burn it all down and start from, you know, let's not, we're not going to tear it down to the studs and, and build it back up again. What we're going to do is create a sort of like middle class republic where things work in a predictable way. And that's what Lafayette wants. And that's what Lafayette keeps trying to explain to Louis. And Louis keeps sort of, you can never kind of decide. Because he's got this, he, Louis is hooked up on this idea of the divine right of kingship, right? And he thinks, I'm king because God says I'm king, right? And so, you know, if I allow people to circumscribe my power, then in a certain sense, that's, that's a violation of God's will because God put me in this position. So if I allow this position to be degraded, that's messing with God's will, right? You can sort of, it makes a kind of certain sense when you look at it from his perspective. Uh, but the rights, I mean, so uh, this is the rights of man and citizen are put together by Saez and by Lafayette in consultation with Thomas Jefferson, who at that point is the US ambassador uh, to France. Basically, it's, it's very similar in a lot of respects to our founding documents. Once again, it's this idea of sort of natural rights of, of man, which seems normal to us, right? Because every school child learns, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed with certain inalienable rights. Among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's a natural law idea. Inalienable rights. You have these rights just in virtue of being a human being. You don't, you don't need a government to give them to you. You have them. A government can respect them or not. I mean, might respect them or not. But you have them intrinsically. This is a new idea. And when it gets asserted in the context of the French Revolution, uh, in the context of this sort of uh, situation in which things are kind of up in the air, it's a real transformation in the way that people are viewed, if you know, if you know what I'm saying. Like the, the aristocrats kind of think, so there's this sort of like idea that the world is the way it is because God means it to be this way. Like there are rich people and poor people, there are aristocrats and, and, and not aristocrats, because God ordains that it's going to be this way. People who are sort of down the, down the income distribution have less rights because God means it to be that way. This is a statement of sort of saying, Every citizen, every man, and every and they do mean men, let's just be clear, has certain kinds of rights that, are, that result directly from their being a human being and don't have to be certified by a king, don't have to be certified by custom. They just are your rights, period. There's a sort of bubbling anger, once again, among the lower sections of the population. Once again, it's a little hard to know exactly what's going on because they don't write it down. There's a sort of feeling that the king is getting kind of bad advice, that the idea is that he's going to disband the, the, the assembly. Also, the price of bread is, is going up. And, you know, people eat bread and potatoes, sometimes fish, and maybe on feast days a little meat. But for the vast majority of the population, about 80% of what you're going to eat is bread. So when the price of bread goes up, that's a matter of real consternation to people. And a little riot gets going in the eastern part of the town. And it's, it's by and large, it's women. Uh, and they go to the Hotel de Ville, the city hall. And the people at the city hall are like, well, here's all the food we have here. Uh, but they decide that they're going to go to Versailles to remonstrate with the king about this. And w once again, this is a real change, right? Because, you know, uh, imagine your feeling bad about how things are going in the government. The idea that you would just roll up to the White House and demand answers from the president, uh, even if you lived in DC, I mean, chances are, like, given the security situation, whatever, but, but you can kind of see, like, for these people, the idea that you would go and talk to the king, 
is a pretty radical idea, but they, you know, they get together this sort of mob of people and they decide they're going to go out to Versailles. Uh, Lafayette sort of sees what's going on and tries to sort of say, you guys should stop, and then calls out the city guard. The city guard says, we're not going to do anything about it. So Lafayette, seeing kind of the better part of valor here, puts himself at the head of the, of the march, right? Because he, he thinks to himself, well, maybe I can kind of direct it to keep things from spinning badly out of control. This is a sort of image, and it's, it's very true to life. It's, it's worth noticing that these women are armed. They have pikes. They've grabbed a cannon or two, and they're like tromping the, you know, it takes them six hours to get out to Versailles from the eastern part of Paris. This is another kind of less good image of them in the countryside, but you can kind of see they're, they're armed. There's people sort of like waving at them from the streets. They get out to Paris and the, or to Versailles. This is Versailles. There's the palace, the front area of the palace. There's the tennis court. There's the meeting hall where they're meeting at, which for some reason is right there. Versailles was a small village and then the king decided that he was going to build his castle there. And they built up a new part of the town to sort of... By the way, if you ever go to... Uh, Versailles is a very sort of influential type place so that if you ever go to uh, Sans Souci, the, the Hohenzollern castle outside of... Uh, in Potsdam outside of Berlin. It's like a miniature model of, of Versailles. And then if you go to the Charlottenburg Castle up in Charlottenburg in the northwestern part of Berlin, that's like a miniature version of that. I mean, um, so they go, uh, kind of roust out the, the delegates, and the delegates say, well, you know, maybe there's nothing really we can do for you right this minute. So they go to the palace, and they lay siege to the palace. And it lasts all night. And around about six in the morning, they find a way into the palace, and they get into the royal chambers, and they force the king and Marie Antoinette out onto the balcony. And then things start to get really dicey, because the, uh, the, the people are shouting things at them, shouting things at Marie Antoinette, who's a foreigner, and uh, starting to call for some very unpleasant turns of affairs. And so Lafayette, in this moment, turns around and kisses the queen's hand as a way of signaling to the crowd, hey, she's okay. And it has the desired effect. Like the crowd start cheering uh, because they, at this point, believe in Lafayette. They believe that, you know, Lafayette is a guy who wants good order in the country. But what the crowd do say is, we're not going to have the king out in the, the sort of boonies here. He needs to come back to Paris now. So they load the royal family, the, the king and, and the queen and their, their child uh, and some retainers into a carriage and they make them come back to Paris with them. So this is, the, this is the scene here you can see Lafayette kissing the queen's hand. They get put up in the, the palace of the Tuileries which is a dark kind of dingy place. I mean it's still a palace, it's not like some hovel. Uh, but it's they're essentially under house arrest. Louis knows this, and he's getting sort of progressively more worried about it. What happens around this time, too, is the legislative assembly starts becoming more and more interested in changing the structure of French society, and in one particular way, by subordinating the Catholic Church to the government. And in this, I mean, the, so the king wanted to do this, too. But what the legislative assembly said was, well, the 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 clerics are now going to have to swear an oath to the French state. And the, the Catholic Church is very down on this idea because they owe, you know, their loyalty, their fealty to a higher power. And so you can't have the state, and I mean, even Louis thinks, hey, this is a little much, right? The monastic orders are outlawed and the, the monasteries are seized. The French government, the Legislative Assembly, asserts the right that they get to elect bishops and that, that, that priests are going to be elected rather than just sort of picked by the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. The Pope comes back and says, okay, so only a fairly small proportion of the priests are willing to swear the oath. And the ones who don't are referred to as non-juring. Uh, the Pope says, uh, you absolutely may not swear the oath. Anybody who swears the oath is, is going to be excommunicated uh, and anybody who has sworn the oath has to immediately rescind it or you're going to be excommunicated. There starts to be this rolling uh, 
conflict. And at a certain point, there's a lot of people around who think that this, who are okay with this. It's really very regional. There are some places where the, the power of the church is very pronounced. There are other places where people think, well, you know, maybe that's all for the best. Um, it tends to be very, you know, uh, very powerful, the, the sort of pro-church hierarchy tends to be very powerful in the rural areas, particularly in the sort of western part of the country. Uh, and in the urban areas, there tends to be more sort of sympathy toward getting the church under the control of the state. Once again, there's not that many people out there who are like, we should just get rid of the church. Uh, at this point, it's still a case of people wanting to organize things in a way that makes sense as opposed to, and it's an assertion of French nationalism. And this in itself is a kind of new thing, right? So if you're sort of the average peasant in Languedoc, there's a good chance you don't even speak French. Probably, I mean, at this point you probably do speak French, but there's a good chance that you speak Occitan. Or if you're in Brittany, there's a very good chance, even to this day, that your first language is Breton. Less so now than it was then. But so what's going on here is the building of a kind of idea of France as an actual uh, thing that exists outside of the royal family, right? I mean, so the kind of absolutist theory of kingship is the state is basically either the possession of or embodied by, in fact, the king. And, and what's getting built up here is this sort of abstract idea of the French state in the way that the, the U.S. state isn't the president and it's not the Congress. The U.S. state is a kind of set of institutions and people that we all sort of, so the U.S. state is kind of abstract. Uh, you know, you don't, when you think of yourself as an American, you don't, in the first instance, think of yourself as a kind of liege man of the president or of the Congress or whatever. You think of yourself as a sort of partaking of a kind of abstract idea of America that's defined by certain kinds of ideas, the life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. But that's a fairly recent kind of development. I mean, we like to think of it as kind of the sort of natural order of things, but in fact, like, it's, it's a fairly recent provenance if you look at the sort of long history of what European life has been about. The king finally sort of decides that, that he's got to get out. By this point, a lot of the, the nobility, the sort of more conservative nobility, have uh, emigrated. And a lot of them are hanging around in Germany, especially around Koblenz. Uh, and the king kind of decides, well, I need, to, I need to get out of here, because he starts worrying that either he's not going to become king, he's not going to be king, or that other worse things might happen to him. Uh, at this point, the, the queen is being uh, advised by a Swedish nobleman named Count Axel von Fersen, and he says, well, why don't we set up this, like, we'll, we'll make a break for it to the east, we'll get across, we'll hook up with a big French army that's out there. The army at this point is still being run by noble officers. We'll get out, you know, maybe we'll go to Germany, you'll be safe there. So they make a break for it. They sort of dress up as, not as peasants, but as kind of like middle class people, if you want to call it that. And the, but they're riding in this gigantic coach, and the, the, the king is like chatting with peasants along the way. <laughs> anyway, so they, they head out east. Uh, things kind of don't work out as they're supposed to. They don't, uh, the, the, there's a kind of crossing of wires as opposed to where they're supposed to meet up with people. Eventually, they get to Varenne, where they're going to sort of switch horses. And uh, you can kind of see them here, there, and they're sort of like, this is like normal people attire. <laughs> now, it's not clear to everybody as they're passing by that this is the king, right? Because there's not photographs of him everywhere. Like, if you're just, you know, like, you've all seen, like, real-time footage of every president in your lifetime. But if you're a, a, a Frenchman living out in the country, there's a good, I mean, Chances are, you've never seen the king, ever. You've never seen a photograph, obviously, because there's no photographs. But he's recognized by the local uh, postmaster, who recognizes him from his picture on this, this is, the, this is an assignat, which is like the currency, the revolutionary currency. And he recognizes him from his picture. And he goes and gets the local National Guard, because like, what the hell's the king doing here? <laughs> Nothing good. There's no reason why the king should be outside of Paris, at this point, like, 
it's not really known that he is outside of Paris. And he gets basically arrested by the National Guard and forced to go back to Paris. And this is the beginning of the end. The final end of the monarchy doesn't happen for, for, for several for months after this, but after this point, the king is kept as a sort of prisoner in the Tuileries, the king and his family. And um, at this point, too, the sort of talk starts to become, what are we going to do with him? And if you're a revolutionary, this presents even if you're a sort of fairly moderate one, I mean, the, the people who voted to have the king executed were mostly lawyers, um, for whatever that's worth, or a lot of them were. Um, a lot of them were journalists, um, whatever that's worth. Um, by the way, let's just be clear about something. Uh, and, and once again, I, I, I strive not to take like political positions from the lectern, because it's not fair to the people who are listening to me, because I have the microphone and you don't. But uh, anytime you start hearing anybody start talking about like, you know, people as enemies of the people, I mean, it's one thing if people have like, you know, raised the Jolly Roger and started slitting throats, to quote Mencken. But, but if you start talking about other people in society as enemies of the people, that's a dangerous way of talking. And studying the French Revolution will, t will teach you this. Like, because in a sort of later point, getting called enemy of the people uh, was very often a precursor to your expulsion from the body of the people or from this mortal coil. Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of thing that when you study history, you get a little nervous when you hear people say that kind of thing. But as far as you know, the people running the country go, at that point, what are you going to do with Louis? Because you can't let him go to some other country. Because it's pretty clear that he still thinks of himself as king. And what is he going to do there? And you can't keep him around. Because once again, he's a sort of like ma magnet for, nexus point for people who want to bring the monarchy back. And so then this talk starts to get going about, you know, if we can't keep him around. And he's, as far as they've concerned, he's conspired with foreign powers to try and get back into power. So that's treason. Now, in a subsequent lecture, we will hear about the execution of poor Louis and his wife, uh, and how things then really went off the rails. There's a kind of interesting theory about, so there's a, I'll just finish by telling you this. There's a kind of long, uh, the history of the French Revolution is one of the sort of most debated things in, in modern history. And it's, there's a very political dimension to it. So for a long time, the sort of history of it was controlled by kind of leftists. There's a, there's a chair at the Sorbonne, a professorial chair, and it was, inhabited by people who were pretty sympathetic to the, to the revolution. And people would say, well, but 1792, 1793, like, the bodies start stacking up. What's up with that? To which the response was, well, there was what was called derapage. The revolution was great to begin with, and then it kind of went off the rails, and then you get, like, Napoleon and whatever. Um, then you get the sort of, like, the kind of pushback from the right that starts in the 1960s with uh, uh, Albert Cobbin, and uh, later on with Francois Furet and uh, Simon Shama. And the idea here is, if you read uh, Shama's book, like, and this is true of Cobbin, I think, too, most of the problems that the revolution was supposed to fix were in the process of getting fixed anyway. And the revolution was a completely needless sort of effusion of blood uh, if you read Shama's book, Citizens, which is a, a, it's a great book. Shama is a great writer. I really, I, I enjoyed the book even if I fundamentally disagree with what he says. But uh, part of the problem with Shama's book is it's a little hard to know why the revolution happened. Since according to his way of telling you, there was really no reason for it. That the, like, the things that it was meant to fix were already, either had been fixed or were in the process of getting fixed. So we can talk about that a little later in the sort of, in my, in my subsequent iteration. But so, in the summer of 1790, you have France gone from uh, an absolutist monarchy to one in which uh, the people, uh, however you want to define that term, are now running the show. And this is a fundamental change. And going forward, uh, it had some good consequences 
and it had some very bad consequences. And next time around, we can talk about some of those. Uh, I've gone on for far too long, but if you have questions, I'm ready to answer them. Yes? Two questions. Sure. So why did Louie agree to do the estates, the state general at all? I mean, there must have been some leverage from somewhere that kind of made him do that. Right. And then the second one is, like with the uh, seizure of Versailles. Yeah. Um, where is the army? Where is the... I'm right. He had protection somewhere or not. Okay. The first one, once again, he was broke, and and he just he couldn't get the uh, the people who had money to agree to give up more money or to give up money without going through this legal hurdle. Um, as far as the siege of Versailles goes, the armies, like the real military part of the army, was out in the field by this point. Uh, the people sort of. The armed people around were the National Guard, and the National Guard were much more loyal to the, the right to the to the to the Legislative Assembly than they were to Louis. He had some military people around him, like Swiss Guards. Uh, there's a point at which the National Guard tries to storm the Tuileries Palace, uh, and there's a there's a shootout basically in the in the courtyard of the Tuileries Palace, and this is another reason why why Louis is very alarmed about his situation because then they go ahead and try the Swiss guards for having defended him. Um, so uh, yeah, once again, I mean, the, the, the question is a good one because it gets to a point very quickly that the guys with the guns are making the decisions and, and the, the uh, aristocrats and the officers are sort of out in the field with the armies on the borders because sort of one of the ideas is, and Louis is on board with this too, like if we have a war with someone else, maybe that'll sort of get us back together at home. This is a, an idea that often strikes people in government and is never a good idea. Uh, like uh, it's sometimes referred to as negative integration. If we can all get together on hating someone else, then we'll, you know, things will work better for us. Other questions? All right, thanks so much for coming out. And be looking on the library schedule because I will do part two of this and then we'll get to some really grim things. Which everybody loves in history.